Hello listeners! This is a video lesson on the basics of morphemes, namely how to recognize and classify them. My name is Jory Lindley. I am visiting assistant professor of applied linguistics at IPFW, that's Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne. This video was created for my fall 2017 students in English G206, but I've tried to keep course specific comments mostly out of it, so it feels designed also for anyone looking for an introduction to morphemes. It's about morphemes in English, and all the examples are in English, but most of what I'll say does apply to other languages as well. And in fact, those of you who speak other languages might find it useful to, as you're listening to this, to try to think of examples from those other languages you speak of the types of morphemes that I'm talking about. As I said, the goal of this lesson is to teach you to identify and categorize morphemes. More specifically, what you'll learn is what a morpheme is, what free versus bound morphemes are, what regarding free morphemes, what content versus function words are. Regarding bound morphemes, you'll learn what affixes, prefixes, and suffixes are. Suffixes are. Prefixes and suffixes are types of affixes. And what inflectional versus derivational morphemes are. You will learn the eight inflectional morphemes in English, because there are only eight of them, so you can learn and memorize all of them and their proper grammatical names. And then by default, if you understand all of the above things, you will know how to if you're given a word, cut it up into its morphemes and label them as one of those types of morphemes above. As a bonus, I'll throw in morphemes that are homonyms and allomorphs. Now, if you are in my English G206 class, I just want to note that you have learned about content versus function words already, but your book calls them form classes versus structure classes. Okay, let's move on now and start learning what a morpheme is. So what is a morpheme? Like a word, it's a combination of sound and meaning. But unlike a word, more specifically, it's defined as the smallest possible unit of meaning. So to, to say the exact same thing in, in slightly different words, it cannot be sliced into further meaningful parts. For example, you can have a cat. And it's one, it's one word, and it's also one morpheme. You cannot chop this up into further meaningful parts. It's not like CA means the cat's head and T means the rest of its body. It's, it's all or nothing. Cat, all three sounds together, means a small domesticated feline. But if you want to talk about many of these, you can add another morpheme, just one little sound, that, that plural marker, the S, cats. One word, cats, two morphemes, cat and s. And you can tell me what each thing means. The first means the small domesticated feline, and the second thing tells us that we're talking about more than one of these. The plur it's the plural marker. Another example is unhappily. How many morphemes do you think there are in unhappily? How many pieces can you cut unhappily into? And the answer is three. Unhappy and Lee. Now, by the way, you might be wondering if I'm cutting up the word using these slashes, is it a problem that happy spelled with an I is not actually a word? Happy is spelled the Y at the end, not with an I at the end. And the answer is don't worry about it. So sometimes when we add morphemes, these funny little things happen with spelling. Sometimes the spelling indicates that we're actually dealing with something called allomorphs, which I'll talk about later, which are variants of a morpheme. But a lot of times when this happens, it's purely a matter of spelling and it's just not that important. So um, in this case, we know to put the slash where we want to put it because we just have a Y turning into an I, which is similar. And we know that LY is a ending that we see on a lot of words, on adverbs especially. So um, we want to have the slashes where they are and it's not a big deal that the Y turns into an I. But if it bothers you, another option is to write it out using plus signs like this, unhappily. And there, happy is spelled the way it is spelled when we see it by itself. But the disadvantage is that when you put it all together, that's not how we spell the word unhappily. So it doesn't matter that much, though. Don't worry about the spelling. Another example is unstoppable. So now think, how many pieces do you think you can cut unstoppable into? And again, the answer is three. Un, stop, enable. And again, we have a, a minor spelling glitch here where the P becomes two Ps. So the word stop only has one P, but unstoppable has two. So where do you put the slash? We want to put it to the right of both of those Ps because able is a piece of the word 
piece of this word that we also see used in other words like doable and lockable and likable. And so that is the morpheme. There's You don't want to put the one of the p's on the right side of the slash because pable, p-a-b-l-e, is not a morpheme in English. And of course you do have the option of using the plus sign method as well instead of the slashes. By the way, you might feel that it isn't easy for you to always clearly explain to someone what something means. For example, able, if you are new to linguistics or grammar or just aren't used to thinking this way, you obviously know what the word unstoppable means if you are a native speaker of English or know English well, but um, it might be hard to, to immediately explain what able means on demand. But by the way, the answer to what it means is in stoppable, it tells us that it is possible to stop something. So stoppable or unstoppable is an adjective. It describes a noun and it means that it's possible to stop this thing an unstoppable force is a force that cannot be stopped, and a stoppable car is a car that you can stop, you are able to stop it. So that is what able means. This should become easier for you as you watch the rest of the lesson or start to think about words in this way, but if you're my student, remember that this is not something I'll ask you to write out for me. You need to be able to chop up the words into their pieces and label them. You don't need to write out for me in a sentence what each one means. But Speaking of times where you struggle to say what a morpheme means, an interesting question is what do you do when you're pretty sure that something is a productive morpheme, meaning um, like able, it seems to appear in a lot of different words, but like for the life of you, you don't know what it means. Not just it's hard to put into words, like it might be with able, but you really have no idea. For example, sieve. If you look up a word like deceive in a dictionary that includes word etymologies, etymology means where the word came from, historically, you'll see that the intuition that this is a morpheme is correct. In Latin, this meant something by itself. Merriam-Webster.com shows you things like this. If you look up a word and then scroll down, look for the etymology part. If you can't find it, you can do control F for etymology. That's spelled E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G. In my classes, and at least in my introduction, at least in my introductory classes, I should say, um, unless I tell you otherwise, the rule sort of when doing homework or exams is that if you and probably everyone else in the room couldn't say what something means by itself without looking up its etymology in a dictionary or without knowing Latin, then it, it isn't a morpheme, not for speakers of English alive in 2017 anyway. Morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning, and if you never in your life knew what sieve meant, then for you, it's not a morpheme. Uh, if you told me that deceive was two morphemes, I would give you credit, but I would also give credit for students who tell me that it's one morpheme because I am not testing you on your knowledge of Latin. That being said, I do suggest looking up words in the dictionary as a way of double checking yourself, at least when you're first getting started with this, these types of exercises, because that way you'll make sure that you don't accidentally overlook a really small morpheme. Now we get to do some practice and by the way, this, this list of words, we're going to use the same list of words throughout the rest of the video. Uh, by the time we're done, you'll have done a bunch of things to these words, building on them as building on what you're learning as we go along. So you definitely want to, to play along to, to do the exercise. So stop the video and get yourself a clean piece of paper and pencil or pen and write out these words. And then what you're going to do is cut them into their morphemes. And I purposely threw in some words here that are only one morpheme. Um, so, and just because it's one morpheme doesn't mean it can't be more than one syllable. So we don't want to confuse morphemes and syllables. It's often the case that morphemes are a single syllable, but I purposely put some in here that have two syllables and there's one in here that has three syllables. So pause the video and write out these words, and then either using the slashes method or the, the plus sign method, I want you to, to cut them into their, their morphemes, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, so good luck with that, and uh, you can pause me and come back to me. So if you're listening to me right now, it means you pushed play again, and you should have finished dividing those words into their morphemes. Now we're gonna go over them and I'm only going to say this once, but it's very important. If, as I'm going over them, the answers you notice 
I mean, if you got something wrong, then please, by all means, stop the video, look at the ones that you have left for me to go over, and, you know, give them a second look and try to make sure that whatever kind of mistake you made on the earlier word, you, you know, see if you can catch other mistakes that you made before I give you the answer, because once I give you the answer, it's not possible for you to go back in time and and do it for yourself again. It's really best if you can get the right answer on your own, and you'll feel better too. So um, definitely stop stop the video along the way if you want to recheck your answers and make extra sure that they're correct based on the feedback that I have given you so far. Okay, so let's. Other than that, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to go over the answers, starting with the first column on the left. The first word, table, is two syllables, but it's just one morpheme. We can't cut that up further. Runner is two morphemes. Run plus ER, meaning a person or anything that runs. But it's not the case that every ER is a morpheme. You can never just assume that certain sequences of sounds or letters are morphemes just because they're morphemes in some words. Over, which is a preposition, is a single morpheme word. It's not a person who oves, it's just one word, over. Likewise, butter, the food, is a single morpheme. However, if we were talking about butter as in head budding, a creature that butts things with its heads, then with its head, then butter would be a, the ER there would be a morpheme. John's is two morphemes, John and the apostrophe that shows that he possesses something. And jolly, I was expecting you to say one morpheme because even though it's an adjective and ends with Y, you probably can't tell me what jol means. It's not a word for us. So jolly is one morpheme. But for the curious, Merriam-Webster says that jolly comes ultimately from the same word from which we get Yule, like Christmas time Yule. It's an Old Norse word for a pagan midwinter festival. And that word passed into French and gained an I-F at the end, and then it passed into Middle English as just J-O-L-I. But long story short, for us, that's one morpheme. Moving to the second column, carrot is just a one morpheme word. Jumping is definitely two morphemes. We have the verb jump and this ing ending to show that the jumping is happening continuously or repeatedly. Disproven is three morphemes. And here we have one where you might wonder where to put the slash mark because prove ends with an e and this ending en that we see on a lot of verbs begins with an e, but there's only one e here. I put the slash before the e, but if you're my student and you put it after the e in this word, that would be fine too. Just don't put it somewhere like before the v. So that would be incorrect. And remember your other option. You can write the word out with plus signs, dis plus prove and plus en. Undo has two morphemes, un plus do. Written also has two morphemes, write plus en. Jumble is one morpheme. I looked this word up too, by the way, just to make sure it wasn't secretly two morphemes. And it turns out that they don't know where this word came from. They think it might've just been invented based on similar sounding words like rumble and stumble but so it's one morpheme. Then we have actions, three morphemes, act, shun, and s. College is a two syllable word, but it's only one morpheme. We can't break it down further. Morphology is two morphemes, morph and ology. And this is where the three syllable morpheme was hiding out. They're hard to think of, but there we have one. Ology, three syllables, just one morpheme. Starvation is two morphemes, starve and ation. Unhelpfully has four morphemes, un, help, full, and li. Because you can be helpful, you can be unhelpful, you can do something helpfully or unhelpfully. So there are lots of there are a lot of different combinations here that we can we can come up with with those four morphemes. Finally, we have irreversibly. This is one where it's really easy to miss one of the morphemes. That IB in particular is easy to miss. It's actually from able, but the able and the lee that follows it kind of share that L sound. So the able gets really condensed into just ib. This one might be one that is good to write out then using the plus sign method. Ear, reverse, able, and lee. I hope these are making sense to you. Please keep your piece of paper with, um, with you with what you've written on it, and we will add to that as we go along. By this point, you know what a morpheme is, and I hope you feel fairly comfortable if given a word saying how many morphemes are in it and what those morphemes are. Now we get to move into saying what type of morphemes we're dealing with. And there are two main types. 
that we that we be, we begin the division with this major division into free and bound morphemes. And those things mean exactly what you would think they mean based on their names. There's only one part that's somewhat tricky. Maybe maybe it won't trip you up at all, but just be aware that a free morpheme is a morpheme that stands alone, like the word cat, or can stand alone. So cat in the word cats, we still consider that a free morpheme because even if it's not standing alone in the word cats, cat plus s, it can stand alone. And that's, I have this, this image here of, of the, the word going and go has wings because it's a free morpheme. Even though in the, in the context of the word going, it's, it's attached to something, it has the ability to be by itself as well. And the is a word that is always free and it never has anything that attaches to it. It's because it is a certain type of word that we'll discuss later. So free morphemes stand alone or they can stand alone, even if they are not standing alone in a given situation. Bound morphemes are the opposite. They, they can never stand alone. They always have to be attached to something. These are things like the ing. It's, it always has to be attached to something, like ing always has to be attached to a verb, and the plural s always has to be attached to a noun. So those are bound. They are attached to something. This is a very good time in the lesson to talk about morphemes and words and how these things are similar and how they're different. It's very closely tied to free versus bound morphemes. So morphemes that are words or can be words are the free morphemes, like the, in, cat, and go. These can stand by themselves and therefore they, they can be words. Morphemes that are not words are the bound morphemes, like I am, like in impossible, itty, like in electricity, un, like unable, in unable, and shun, like in action. These, these cannot be words. They're, they're never words, and that just comes naturally out of their definition. They, they are bound morphemes. They have to be attached to something, so they can never be by themselves, so they can never be words. We will only see them as parts of words. They never, they never are an entire word by themselves. We also have words that are not morphemes, and these are simply multi-morpheme words. So um, a word like going, it has two morphemes. So we can't, we can say go is a morpheme, and we can say ing is a morpheme, but going is not a morpheme because it has two morphemes. So going is a word, but not a morpheme. We can return now to our list of words that I said we would continue to work with. What we did with them so far was we simply marked off the morphemes. If it was a one morpheme word, we didn't do anything to it. And if it was a multi-morpheme word, we put a slash, slashes in between the morphemes. Well, now you know about two types of morphemes, free morphemes and bound morphemes. And we can identify those here. And the easiest way to do this is to circle or underline the free morphemes. And if you think about it, based on their definitions, or just based on what the, what the words free and bound mean in any context, every word is going to have one free morpheme, and beyond that, it might not have any bound morphemes, but every word has to have at least one free morpheme, and we can think of that as the, the heart of the word, the most important part of the word that everything else, if there are, if there isn't everything else, meaning if there are other parts, they build on this part. So what I want you to do is look at this list of words and try to find the, the free morphemes, the ones that are standing by themselves as words or could stand by themselves. So, and you can circle them or underline them. If you care, I'm going to be underlining them, but try to underline the free morphemes. And by default, anything that you don't underline, you are, you are saying that that is a bound morpheme. So underline the free ones, leave the bound morphemes untouched. Okay, so pause the video and, and do that, and then plus press play again when you are ready to see what the answers are. Welcome back, um, unless you push the button accidentally, in which case, please pause it again, because I'm about to say the answers. I will start again by going over the, the left column first. So what are the free morphemes in that, that left column of words? So table is a one morpheme word, so it has to be also a free, a free morpheme. So we just underline the whole thing, table. 
the heart of runner is run, which is a verb. Over is also a free morpheme. It's a one. It's a one morpheme word. So we have no choice but to assume that. Um, assuming you correctly identified that as a single morpheme word, which it is, then that is also a free morpheme. So it gets underlined. Butter, single morpheme word, has to be a free morpheme then. Gets underlined. John and Johns, that is our, the heart of that word, not the apostrophe S. So that's a free morpheme because we can say John went to the store and I see John. It can stand as a word by itself, of course. Jolly is a word by itself. Now, adjec adjectives are used to modify other words, but of course they are also words in themselves. If you got any of those incorrect, then please pause the video and check out the ones you have left and make sure you're confident in your answers. I'm about to discuss the answers for the middle column of words. Carrot is a one, a single morpheme word, so obviously it's a free morpheme as well. Jumping has two morphemes, and jump, the first morpheme, is our free morpheme. ing can only exist when it's attached to a verb. By the way, the er in runner, that, that kind of er, that can only exist when it is attached to a noun, or sorry, uh, a verb again. And the apostrophe s can only exist when it's attached to a noun. Disproven is three morphemes, and prove is the free morpheme because we can use prove by itself as a verb, whereas the dis and the en have to be attached to verbs. Undo is a two morpheme word, and here the, the free morpheme is the second word, do, which is a verb. Un is a suffix, a prefix, which has to be attached to the beginning of a verb. Written comes from comes from the verb to write, so that is our free morpheme, write, and the en is something that needs to be attached or bound. Jumble is a single word morpheme, so it is free word, free morpheme. And our last column we have act is the base of actions. That's a verb to act. It doesn't stand alone here, but it could stand alone, so it counts as a free morpheme. College is standing alone, and it's a noun. Morphology is built upon morph. You might think that's a verb, and that's totally understandable because morph is a verb in English also, but here it's actually the noun morph, like a shape or a form of something, just because that's how ology words work in Greek. Think about Scientology if that helps. It's science, which is a noun, plus ology. Starve is the base of starvation, and it's a verb to starve. Help is the base of unhelpfully, like morph, unless you've studied English morphology rules, it's, it's hard to tell if it's a noun or a verb. For now, you'll just have to trust me when I say it's a noun. Finally, reverse is what's at the heart of irreversibly, and that's a verb. And like I said, anything that um, isn't underlined here, we're saying by default that that's a bound morpheme. It has to be attached to something, so we only underlined the, the free morphemes. I hope the exercise that we just did went well for you and that you feel that you're understanding things. Now that you, you know what morphemes are and what bound and free morphemes are, I can. it's a good time to present this diagram to you. This is what the whole lesson boils down to, except I'll also throw in the bonus mini topics of allomorphs and morphemes that are homonyms. But other than that, as I said, the goal of this, this lesson was to know what morphemes are, be able to point to them in words, say what they are, and label them as the different types of morphemes. And so far we are at the point where you know what morphemes are and you can find them in words and, and you can tell me if they're bound or free. But we still need to talk about these other subdivisions of morphemes in English. Um, by the way, this is a chart, a diagram of the morpheme possibilities in English. But as I said, as I said at the beginning of this video, there this is still useful information, even if your main interest is a language other than English. And if you are thinking about those other languages that you know, you can try to think, ask yourself, does does this language I know have bound morphemes? Or, you know, what are the free morphemes in my language? And are they content words or function words? And so on. So you can be applying this to the other languages that you know, but some of the things are specific to English and I'll highlight some of those things, but in general we're learning a lot of terms here that apply to morphemes across the world's languages. Now what about the rest of this, 
the terms we haven't learned yet. We, I said we learned what morphemes are and bound versus free. Let's talk about content words versus function words. The easiest way to decide if a free morpheme is a content word or a function word is simply to ask, is it a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb? Because those are our four content words. So if it's one of those things, it's a content word. And if it's not, it's a function word. Function words are these grammatical words like and, the, and pronouns. You might feel like pronouns should be content words since they're pronouns after all, but pronouns are special for various reasons. Function words also include auxiliary verbs. This is like the is and she is running and the have and I have eaten. Eat is the main verb and I have eaten and have there is only serving a supporting role. But this is not something you need to master right now. Just remember that if it's not a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb, it is a function word. If you're in my English G206 class, we've been calling these two groups of words form classes versus structure classes. And although I'm choosing the better known terms, content words and function words here, there is one thing I do really like about the term form classes, which I mentioned to you um, in class last week or so. We can call content words form classes because these are the words that come in different forms. We can say love, loved, loving, or boy and boys, and so on. Whereas function words never come in different forms. The is always just the. You can't talk about plural the, you can't make it past tense, and so on. Now, precisely because function words always stand by themselves, I'll barely talk about them in this lesson. This lesson is about picking words apart into their separate pieces, and, well, function words have no pieces. They, they have only one piece. So for that reason, nearly all of my examples involve content words instead. Another type of morpheme that we can talk about is um, there are these morphemes called bound roots, and they're very rare, and so they, they only take up a small amount of space on this diagram, and they, they aren't going to be a major topic to cover here, but these are things like the sieve that I talked about. This is something that in Latin is a morpheme, but for you as a speaker of English, and, and maybe for speakers of Latin, I'm not sure, it never appears by itself. So it's not like the plural s or the, the prefix on and unable. It's it feels more word-like, but it only it's still like like a thing like on or plural s. It can't appear by itself. So we call these bound roots. They have to always be attached to something, but they are they they, they feel like they should be free morphemes almost. They feel like a lot more than the usual um, affix, but they are so they're a root, but they are bound. And the only English, well, not the only, but the main English example I give of this is the Luke in lukewarm. So we know that warm means something, and we know what warm means. We have this this word lukewarm to describe temperature of water generally, and you can't say what Luke means. It it's very rare in English. This morpheme it only appears in this word as far as I know, so it's not productive. That is a bound root. It you can't just say Luke by itself unless you are talking about the name Luke or Lucas. Now, beyond that, the thing we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about is are these affix excuse me, affixes. Affix, um, if you think about the verb affix. If you affix something to something else, you are attaching it to something else, you can affix a poster to the wall. So affixes are things that have to be attached to other things. Bound roots are, are rare, so if you, are, if you have correctly identified an English morpheme as being bound, then it is almost certainly an affix that you're dealing with. And these come in two types, derivational and inflectional. And before I explain what those two types are, I just want to mention that there are also two possible types of each of those types, prefixes and suffixes, and these are quite straightforward. Prefixes come at the beginning of a word, and suffixes come at the end of a word. And now in English, actually, we when it comes to derivational affixes, we can have both types, but inflectional affixes in English, they are all suffixes. Now, why is it like this? There's no particular reason, but so you can imagine, though, that there are other languages that have inflectional prefixes, even though English only has inflectional suffixes. 
And you can imagine a language where all of the derivational affixes are prefixes and they don't have derivational suffixes. This is just how it works. What you see in front of you here is this is just how it works out in English. It happens to be the case that in English, derivational affixes, some of them are prefixes and some are suffixes, but all of the inflectional affixes are suffixes in English. And like the list of content words for the for the list of the list of suffix suffixes here that are inflectional, I'm giving you a complete list. So there are only eight, and we will talk about these in detail. If you memorize those eight, then if you're trying to decide between something being derivational or inflectional, you can just ask, is it one of those eight? And if it's not one of those eight, it will be derivational if, if you're dealing with an affix. Now, another way to know you're dealing with a derivational affix is if it's a prefix, because in English, in English, this trick will work. In other languages, it might not. But in English, if you know that you have a prefix, then you know it's derivational because we do not have inflectional prefixes. Now I have to explain what these two things mean, derivational versus inflectional affixes. The distinction here is very much like the distinction between content words and function words. They're sort of the bound equivalent of content words and function words. What I mean by this is that the categories on the right, inflectional suffixes, in, um, underneath bound morphemes, and function words underneath free morphemes, we can think of these as grammatical morphemes. In the categories on the left, derivational affixes under the bound morphemes and content words under free morphemes, we can think of these as making a more dramatic contribution to meaning. For example, even though the plural s, which is an inflectional suffix, it contributes something to the meaning, like girls is plural and girl is singular, we're still mostly talking about the same thing, a or many young female human beings. Or think about verbs, whether I say jump or jumped, past tense, or jumping, present participle, in all three cases I'm talking about the act of jumping, not three very different actions. In contrast, derivational affixes make a dramatic contribution to the meaning of the word that they're added to, and in fact sometimes they even change the type of word that it is. So for example, quick is an adjective, that's a free morpheme and a content word, quick, if we add the derivational suffix ly to quick, we get quickly, which is now an adverb instead of an adjective. So now instead of giving us information about a thing, a noun, it's giving us information about an action, a verb. So that's definitely a pretty big change in meaning. Other derivational affixes, like the, the prefixes you see here um, on the screen, they don't change words into different types of words, but they still contribute dramatically to the meaning. For example, tie, like in to tie your shoe, is a verb, and if we add to it the derivational prefix un, we get untie, and that's still a verb, and it's still about the act of tying. But tie and untie have really different meanings. In fact, these actions are the total opposite of each other, so we say that that's a dramatic change in meaning, even if it did not change it from a verb to something else. It's, it, it remains a verb, but now we have the total opposite action. I'm going to change the slide now, but um, I'm not done talking about derivational and inflectional suffixes just yet. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each, starting with inflectional suffixes, actually. So more about those inflectional suffixes. We have eight of them. We have two inflections we add to nouns, the s that makes things plural and the apostrophe s that shows possession. Verbs take four inflections. First, there's this little inflection with a big name the third person singular present tense s. It's called that because we only see it on verbs describing the action of third person singular subjects like he, she, it, and only in the present tense. We say, I go, you go, we go, they go, but he, she, or it goes. So that's, that's the s we're talking about. ed is our past tense. en turns verbs into the past participle, like written, as in, I have written a letter. Now, some verbs in this same context will take ed instead, like I have jumped, but we're not going to get into the details of regular versus irregular verbs here. Just know that if you see en at the end of a verb or ed, it's going to be a morpheme. Finally, ing turns verbs into the present participle, like jumping, singing, laughing. Then there are two inflections that adjectives and adverbs can take the comparative, er, like in bigger, and the superlative, the est in a word like biggest. Now, if you're wondering where ly is, um, 
which we see in adverbs, it's not here in this list because that's a derivational suffix, not an inflectional suffix. Another thing about the adjective and adverb inflections, if you're thinking, well, aren't ER and EST for adjectives only, not for adverbs? Because we can't, we can't say things like quickliest. Quickly is an adverb, and we can't add EST to it. And that's true, we can't say quickliest, but remember that adverbs are not just, we don't just have adverbs of manner, like quickly, but adverbs of time and place, like near and far and soon. And many of these adverbs can take ER and EST, like soon, sooner, soonest, and nearest, and so on. So those are the eight inflectional suffixes in English, and because there are only these eight, you can easily tell if you're dealing with an inflectional or derivational affix, because if it's one of these eight, it's inflectional, and if it's not, it's derivational. Just watch out for ER is all. The ER in bigger is inflectional, because it's about a comparison, like big versus bigger, but the ER that I talked about earlier in runner is not inflectional, it's derivational, because it changes um, the verb run into a noun, runner. And speaking of derivational affixes, I promised I would talk about both derivational affixes and inflectional affixes in more detail. I just talked about inflectional affixes, which in English happen to all be suffixes. We definitely want to use the term affix for the derivational affixes because affix captures both prefixes and suffixes, and derivational affixes do come in both forms. As I've said, inflectional affixes provide grammatical information, derivational ones provide some sort of important contribution to the meaning. They can dramatically change the meaning and sometimes they change the word class. Now, what we're gonna do is look at these, these 10 derivational affixes and try to figure out what type of word it attaches to and what type of word results after you've added, what, what type of word is the result after you've added this affix. And we'll do the first two together. So, T-I-O-N and E-R. And I'm telling you that these, you're not trying to figure out if these are inflectional or derivational. I'm telling you these are all derivational. So you know that it's not the ER like big, bigger, biggest. That's inflectional. This is that ER like we saw earlier on runner. And the T-I-O-N, we saw that on, I think, more than one word. So what is going on here? We have a rule where a verb plus T-I-O-N, or sometimes just I-O-N, and sometimes A-T-I-O-N, results in a noun. We saw this with action. Act is a verb, and you add I-O-N, and it becomes a noun, action. Another derivational suffix is the E-R in runner. You add E-R to verbs like run, and they become nouns. That's what you need to do for the remaining eight words here. Please pause the video and try to write down for yourself what type of words these prefixes or suffixes attach to, and then after you've added them, what type of word is the entire thing? So please pause the video and take your time trying to figure out the answers to that and then come back. Welcome back. I'm going to go over the answers now. First, I'll show the answers to the words on the left, and then I'll show the answers to the words on the right all at once. Now, I was going to hold off on talking about allomorphs towards till the end of the lesson as, as a bonus, I said, but now is actually a perfect time to bring it up and then I'll just reiterate it later. But allomorphs are variants of the same morpheme and this can happen just, we can say them differently but not spell them differently. Maybe you aren't even aware that we say them differently, but sometimes we say them differently and we spell them differently to reflect that different pronunciation. So IR versus IL, this is the same morpheme, but depending on what comes right after it, we will see IR or we'll see an R, R or an L. So in the word illegal, the morpheme legal begins with an L, so that is why we see IL. But in a word like irreligious irreli 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 or some people say um, irregardless, because there's an R coming up, then the, the morpheme involves an R as well. The, the derivational prefix involves an R as well to match the sound that's about to come. So illegal is ill plus legal, that's I-L plus an adjective, and it is still an adjective after we've added the I-L, but we see an important change in meaning. Um, and one, th this is the opposite, so something that was legal has become not legal, that's a pretty big change in meaning. Meant is something that we add to verbs, and they become nouns, so Arguing is a verb to argue. Meant, argument is a noun. 
excite, like to excite is a verb, excitement is a noun. Finally, if I, this attaches the adjective, so simple is an adjective, we add if I and it becomes a verb. So we change the word class there. We change the word class in all of these first five except, except ear illegal. It was an adjective to begin with, legal, and it remained an adjective. All the other, the other four, we saw a change in word class. And, and again, remember, all of these are derivational, but not all derivational affixes change the word class. Now let's look at our final column. I'm going to give all the answers all at once. We have here another example of an allomorph, a morpheme that takes takes two variants, and we represent that in spelling in this case, which, as I said, we don't always do that when there are, when there are variants, but we can have in or im, and they these are essentially the same. Like in, like an in inactive, like an inactive volcano, and im, like an impossible. In impossible, we have im plus adjective equals adjective. Same thing for inactive. Um, active, act is a verb, active is an adjective, and inactive is also an adjective. So this one doesn't change the word class. Eyes is a very productive one in English. We use it to turn nouns into verbs. Theory is a noun, and if you add eyes, you can talk about theorizing, coming up with theories. Re is something that only attaches to verbs, and it dramatically changes the meaning because there's a big difference between testing someone and testing them again. It's a different scenario and situation, but the word class remains the same. It's a verb at the beginning and it's a verb after we add re to it. Ish is interesting. Just because I tell you that um, some, something can be added to a certain type of word doesn't necessarily mean it can't be added to other types. Ish can be added to adjectives like reddish, like the red ball, the reddish ball, and in that case it remains an adjective. Um, or ish can be added to nouns like boyish and girlish, and then we see a change in word class. So ish changes the word class when it's added to nouns, but it doesn't change the word class of words when it is added to adjectives because they are already adjectives. But it always results in an adjective. Finally, there's ness, and we add this to adjectives like Ugly is an adjective, and ugliness is a noun, so it dramatically changes the meaning by changing the word class. So these are derivational affixes. Sometimes they change the word class, sometimes they don't, but they always involve a dramatic change in meaning, and they come in both the form of prefixes and suffixes. At this point, you know all the different types of morphemes that I wanted to cover. And we can return to our list of words just to summarize what we did with this list of words so far. The first thing you did was divide them into their morphemes. For some of them, that meant doing nothing at all because they were single morpheme words. Then you learned the difference between bound and free morphemes, and you underlined or perhaps you circled all of the free morphemes. Those are underlined here in purple. We talked since then about content words versus function words. But I said that in this lesson, we are not focusing on function words almost at all. There is, but we, so normally we could go through and label all of our, our free morphemes as being content words or function words. But in this case, they are all content words except one of them. And can you see the one, the one word here that is a function word? The one word here that's a function word is over. It's a preposition. Remember our content words were nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs, and everything else was a function word. Function words, part of, part of knowing what they are is knowing that they can never take any affixes. So if it's, um, if it's a function word, it has to be a single morpheme word. And there are only a few single morpheme words here one of them is over and over is a preposition. So again, if it's not a noun, adjective, adverb, or verb, then it is a function word. And there's only one function word here, so it's not worth going through and discussing them all because everyone except every purple underlined morpheme except over is a content word. But what we can do is look at our, our affixes and decide if these 
are inflectional or derivational. And I will tell you now that none of these are, we don't have any bound, any bound roots here. There are no words like the Luke in lukewarm. So all of, all of the things that are not underlined are going to be either derivational or inflectional. So pause the video and label all of those with a little D, like the ER and runner, you need to label that with a little D or a little I to say it's derivational or inflectional. All right, I'm about to go over the answers. If you're not ready to see them yet, please hit pause again. Otherwise, here we go. I had told you to label the bound morphemes using a little d for derivational or i for inflectional. I hope you'll forgive me, I use circles and colors instead. The circled, the things that are circled in green are inflectional suffixes, and they are all suffixes. They all come at the end of the word, and the things that are circled in gray are derivational affixes, and these can come, remember, at the beginning of a word, like the dis in disproven, or they can also come um, some of them come at the end of the words, like the Lee on irreversibly. Beyond simply telling me if the affixes here are derivational or inflectional, what else can you tell me about them? Regarding the inflectional suffixes, you should be able to say um, which exactly which of the eight inflectional suffixes in English they are. So we have four of them here. There are five things circled in green, but two of them are, are the same thing, en. Starting with the apostrophe S, that is our possessive marker. It attaches to nouns. We also have the, another, another thing that attaches to nouns, the, the plural S on act, in actions. And then we have two that attach to verbs, the ING and the EN. ING was called the present participle, and EN was called the past participle. So we see this in context like, I have written the letter, or I will have disproven your theory by then. As a side note, but don't worry about it too much, other verbs in this context will take an ed, and the difference there is it depends if the verb is regular or irregular, but that's not the focus. We're not going to focus on that. But so we have apostrophe s and plural s that attach to nouns and present participle ing and past participle en. The ones that we're missing, there are four that we're missing here, and those are the er, comparative, and est, superlative, like big, bigger, biggest. We do have an ER here on runner, in runner, but that's actually derivational because that attaches to the verb run and it turns it into a noun, a person who runs. It's not the same as the ER in bigger. And we are also missing the past tense ED. And fourth one we're missing out of the eight is the present third person singular present tense, S. That is that little S that we see in things like he sings or um, it runs. Regarding our derivational affixes, we can say, we could say if they are prefixes or suffixes, but that's pretty straightforward. If they come at the beginning of the word, they're a prefix, and if they come at the end, they're a suffix. We can say what kinds of words they attach to and whether or not they change the word into a different type of word, and if they do that, what the, the new resulting type of word is. I already said that the ER in runner is an instance of a derivational morpheme attaching to a verb, run in this case, and it results in a noun, a, a person or some creature that runs. Dis and disproven, this attaches to verbs and they remain verbs, so there is not a change in word class here. Prove and disprove are both verbs. The on and undo, this attaches to verbs as well and they remain verbs. So do is a verb, undo is also a verb. Then we have the ION, or sometimes it's TION or ATION, like an action and starvation. This attaches to verbs like act and starve, and it turns them into nouns, action, starvation. Then we have our three syllable morpheme, ology, and this is a derivational suffix that attaches to nouns and they remain nouns. Now remember earlier I said this was a little bit of a tricky example because morph looks like it could also be a verb and because we have this verb to morph. But uh, I said you just sort of had to trust me that in Greek, these are both, both of these morphemes come from Greek and in Greek we add, they add ology to nouns. 
So morphology is a suffix that we add to nouns, and the result is a noun as well. It doesn't change the word class. It starts out as a noun, and it remains a noun, but it has a very different meaning. It changes from meaning the noun to meaning the study of that noun. Next one I would like to talk about is the full and unhelpfully, or full in general. So this attaches to nouns, and again we have um, helpful maybe isn't the greatest example because help is also a verb, but if you try to think of some other examples with, with full, you will see that it is actually attaching to nouns. So for example, joyful, joy is a noun and you put full on it and it becomes an adjective then, a joyful person, or bountiful, and that is full attaching to the noun bounty, and it becomes an adjective, bountiful. Um, so that's part of the word unhelpfully, but it, we have four morphemes here. The un and unhelpfully actually is different from the un and undo. The un and undo is means something like the opposite or to reverse something. The un and unhelpfully just means something like, like not. So we have, can have a helpful person and a person who is not helpful. So this this on attaches to adjectives and it means the um, it means not someone is not that adjective so the person is not helpful and then finally we add the ly there and it, the whole thing becomes an adverb so ly is something that we attach to adjectives so help is a noun helpful makes it an adjective adding the un makes it, well, it remains an adjective but now it means someone who's not helpful. And then we add the ly and the whole thing becomes an adverb describing an action. Finally, the last word is irreversibly. And the ear here is quite a bit like the un and unhelpfully. It also attaches to adjectives and it turns them into something meaning not that adjective. But what adjective is it attaching to? Well, to understand that, first we need to talk about the able. So able is added to verbs and it turns them into adjectives. So full was added to nouns and turns them into adjectives. Help, the noun plus full. Um, able is added to verbs. So to reverse is a verb, but something that is reversible, this is an adjective now saying it's possible to reverse this thing. So reversible is an adjective and we add ear to adjectives to make them mean not that adjective. So irreversible is an adjective saying that something is not reversible, it's not possible to reverse it. And then again, like unhelpfully, we add an ly to that whole thing and it becomes an adverb. We're not going to play around with this list of words anymore. I just have two more things to talk about. Allomorphs and morphemes that are homonyms, and then I'll sum things up and we'll be done here. But so I hope Regarding this list of words, I hope you've been able to follow along and it's been making sense to you, or if, if you didn't get the correct answers, then at least after you were given the explanations, it made sense. If you have been able to successfully follow along, then think about how far you've come. Look at, look at all the different things we did with this list of words. And you know, we started with just saying what the morphemes were and we ended up categorizing them in all sorts of different ways. So you've come a long way and thank you for sticking with me this long. Just two more things to talk about and then we'll be done. I ended up spilling the beans on allomorphs ahead of time because I could not resist mentioning them when I presented certain morphemes to you as pairs with a slash between them, like IR, the prefix IR or IL, like IL and illegal, and IR, like irreligious, and um, well, the other one was I, is, is on this slide here, um, IM or IN. I, these are considered the same morpheme in slightly different forms, depending on which words, um, which sounds are going to come right after them. Another example is of a suff, uh, that's a prefix coming in different forms. Another example of an affix coming in different forms, in this case a suffix, is the plural marker. It actually sounds different depending on which word it's in. So in dogs, it's pronounced like a Z. And in cats, it's pronounced like an S. This is a due to a phonology rule, which I don't have time to get into here. But so there we see two examples, three if we include the IR, IL example of affixes coming in different forms. We also can see the, the base word, the, the, the main word that the affixes build on coming in different forms. This happens, for example, with leaf. When we make it plural, we say leaves. Uh, notice that that's another plural where it sounds like Z. 
leaves, but the important thing we're focusing on here is that leaf ends in an F and leaves has a V in it. This also happens with some other words, similar thing. We see, um, I have to use the phonetic alphabet here, which you may not be familiar with, but um, I'll explain. Please is, that vowel in the middle of please is an E sound, please, but the vowel in that same part of the word in pleasant is eh, ple, esent. And we see something similar with um, press and pressure. Here is not the vowel that changes, it's, it's like leaf leave where it's a consonant that changes. In press it's an S, but pressure comes from the word press. And in, now we have that S is pronounced like a sh, that funny looking S, there is a sh, an SH. So press, pressure, please, ple, asn't, instead of please, and leaf, f, leave, z, dogs, cats, impossible but inactive. So these are allomorphs. The last thing to discuss is that you probably know what homonyms are. These are words that sound the same, but they have different meanings. Um, we can have the same thing happen with morphemes, especially given that you know that some morphemes are also words. Of course, we can have morphemes that are homonyms. It can also happen with the affixes, though, not just the base words. So an example is of a, a free morpheme that is a homonym is bill, like duck bill versus a dollar bill. And an example of a affix that is a homonym, we've talked about it a bunch of times already, actually. Um, the ER is generally when you see that, you're going to think, oh, that's a inflectional suffix, like bright, brighter, brightest. But it can also, we saw it in runner and jogger that this can be derivational. And in that case, it means something like a person who does this thing. In brighter, the ER means, um, shows us that whatever adjective comes before it, you're talking about that being, there being more of that or that being stronger. The ER in singer means a person who does this thing and attaches to verbs. So ER is a, ER and singer and ER and writer are homonyms and bill, like a duck bill and bill versus a dollar bill are homonyms. That brings us almost to the end of the lesson. I'd like to finish with a quick summary. This is a simplified version of the diagram of English morphemes that you saw earlier. You now know what morphemes are. You can recognize them in words. You can say if they're bound or free. If they're free, you can say if they are content words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, or adverbs, or function words, which is everything else, like the and and. I didn't focus on function words because they're no fun, so to speak, for, our, for what we needed to do today, because we can't attach things to them. But content words can have things attached to them. Aside from a few rare exceptions, which are called bound roots, morphemes that need to be attached to content words are called affixes. Affixes that come before the content word are called prefixes, and affixes that come after the content word are called suffixes. But more importantly, you learn that we divide English affixes into derivational affixes versus inflectional affixes. And inflectional affixes happen to all be suffixes. There are only eight inflectional affixes in English, like these are things like plural s and the ing on verbs, and then all the other affixes are derivational. Derivational affixes always dramatically change the meaning of the word they're attached to, like on attaches to verbs, and then they mean the total opposite of what they meant without the on. And some of the derivational affixes even change the type of word, like ment attaches to the end of verbs, like excite, and it turns them into nouns, like excitement. I gave you a list of words, and you were able to find all the morphemes in them and apply all of these labels to them. So I, I hope you've found this useful and been able to follow along successfully. If you have questions, if you're my student, then of course you can come to office hours. If you're someone else, don't hesitate to leave your question in the comments section below and I'll try to get back to you. Thank you for listening.